The time is now 7.03, and I would like to call the Beloit City Council meeting to order at this time. First order of business is uh, roll call. Roll call shows all seven councilors present. Thank you. Second agenda, uh, agenda item is our Pledge of Allegiance. May we all stand. <coughs> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item is special order of the day and announcements. Uh, item 3A is a presentation of Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. Mr. York, please. Thank you, Mr. President. It's my uh, pleasure to announce this evening that uh, the city has received for the 13th consecutive year the Government Finance Officers uh, Distinguished budget <coughs> presentation award for its uh, 2011 budget, uh, which we submitted uh, to the GFOA for review uh, shortly after uh, the budget was approved late last year. Uh, the bu GFOA budget presentation award uh, is a program that they established in uh, 1984. Uh, its purpose is to encourage and assist uh, state and local governments uh, to prepare budgets of the various highest quality uh, that reflect both guidelines established by the National Council uh, on state and local budgeting uh, and the GFOA's uh, best practices on budgeting. Uh, the documents are reviewed by an independent panel uh, selected by the GFOA, uh, includes both uh, some of their professional staff as well as independent reviewers. Uh, who typically represent uh, other budget preparers uh, from city or state governments. Uh, as a matter of fact, our budget analyst that works for the city, uh, Jessica Tyson, she serves as a reviewer uh, for the GFOA for other cities that submit their budgets for this award program. Um, the, uh, I think a lot of the recognition uh, that goes toward the uh, receiving this award certainly um, should be directed toward uh, the finance department staff, <coughs> uh, particularly our, our budget analyst, uh, Jessica Tyson. She spends an incredible amount of time each year compiling the budget, putting the document <coughs> together. Uh, of course, Larry and I typically review it uh, before it's submitted. Uh, it has uh, some of our input. Uh, it, it's, it's really sort of a group project uh, to put this thing together. Uh, and it's. It represents a significant amount of work uh, and commitment. Um, I know, you know, we meet with the council a few times throughout the year to discuss the budget and to debate the budget, but behind the scenes, it's an incredible undertaking uh, staff-wise uh, to meet with departments uh, probably for a, a two or three month period there during the summer. We're starting to head into the middle or the midst of our budget season uh, as we speak. Uh, matter of fact, uh, next Monday night we have our first uh, session with the City Council to sort of kick off the budget. Uh, we'll be working on the document uh, the rest of this summer. Uh, and of course, the plan for at least the 2012 budget is to have that prepared and to present that to the Council at your first meeting in October. Uh, but before we get to that point again, there's an extreme amount of, of work involved in, in putting the document together. So we're very pleased and proud of the fact that those efforts uh, have been recognized uh, by the Government Finance Officers Association and, and our peers uh, have actually judged us on this document. And uh, part of the process is we, we do receive a, a, a nice plaque. Um, which actually we just got this on Friday, so so timing was pretty good. Yeah, this no, this is actually the one uh, for 2011, and uh, we actually we display this each year in our um, trophy case out here in, <coughs> in front of the uh, council chambers. Uh, the most current uh, year's award we we display out here, and we have some of the others uh, on display in the finance department. And one of the other things that we receive as part of this award, uh, we get a real nice summary of reviewer comments from the people that looked at our budget document. And they make recommendations to us on 
ways that we can improve the document each year from uh, a user standpoint uh, and, and to present information uh, more understandable to the public. Uh, and we typically incorporate their recommended changes into our document uh, on an annual basis. And, and that's really one of the, sort of one of the criteria of the awards program is uh, you know, to provide input to us uh, to allow us to make our budget uh, a more meaningful document, a more usable document uh, for the people that, that need to use it. Um, so with that, I, um, again, I'm very pleased with the fact that, uh, again, for the 13th year we've received this award and uh, the plan is to continue uh, to participate in this program uh, as years go by. So. Thank you. Right, Councilor Van Bogart. Uh, Mr. Yard, a couple questions real quickly. How much staff time is involved in this application process? How many communities around the country or the state apply and how many get it? Uh, there's a, as far as the app, application process yeah. itself, it's, it's, uh, there's not a, a significant amount of time involved. Good. I mean, mm -hmm. you essentially, uh, there's a three or four page application form <coughs> you complete and uh, you, you submit your budget document along with that. Uh, so, I mean, the, the time involved is, is probably, you know, an hour or two at best. Okay. Um, as far as the number of participants, I'm not sure total throughout the United States. I know in uh, the, the most recent information I saw on the GFOA, GFOA website was for 2009, and there were only 22 Wisconsin uh, cities that received the award for that year. Uh, so that gives you some indication as far as uh, the number of people that are receiving it, at least in this state. Um, not sure how many people applied and, and didn't uh, receive the award, uh, but it, uh, you know we are one of 22 in Wisconsin that <coughs> did receive it that year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Clark. Item 3B is a proclamation recognizing July as Park and Recreation Month. Uh, Vice President uh, Van de Bogart. Good evening, Brian. Good evening. And he will this is an official here. proclamation of the City of Beloit. Whereas parks and recreation programs are an integral part of communities throughout this country, including here in Beloit, and whereas our parks and recreation are vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in our communities, ensuring the health of all citizens and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of a community and region. And whereas parks and recreation programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, provide therapeutic recreation f services for those who are mentally or physically disabled, and also improve the mental and emotional health of all citizens. And whereas parks and recreation programs increase a community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, the attraction and retention of businesses, and crime reduction. And whereas parks and recreation areas are fundamental to the environmental well-being of our community, and whereas parks and natural recreation areas improve water quality, protect, protect, uh, no, protect excuse me, groundwater, prevent flooding, improve the quality of the air we breathe, provide vegetative buffers to development, and pro produce habitat for wildlife, and whereas our parks and natural recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for children and adults to connect with nature and recreate outdoors, and whereas the U.S. House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month, and whereas Beloit recognizes the benefits derived from parks and recreational resources, now therefore be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Beloit, Rock County, Wisconsin, hereby designates that July as Park and Recreation Month in the City of Beloit. Adopted this 20th of June, 2011. Signed, uh, Kevin D. Levy, Council President. Brian, congratulations. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank, thank, thank you very much. If I may just follow, follow, follow up with a few few words. Um, I appreciate this um, and thank you, uh, the Council, on behalf of uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission, as well, well as the staff for this special presentation tonight. I'd also like to uh, share with you some of the quick, quickly, all of the, our parks are up and run, r running. We have a lot going going on, on in them. Uh, as many of you know, just to highlight a few of those, uh, we have music in the park that's offered by uh, Friends of the Riverfront going on in Riverside Park now. The pool is open and, op and operate and, op and operational. 
Um, we have all, all other events to be held in Riverside Park with uh, July 4th celebration, as well as uh, immediately following it will be the, riv the annual ri River Fest event. Um, and I think the best news that we're pleased to announce is as many of those who've been concerned about our golf course, um, we are opening all 18 holes as of July 1st. So we're very pleased about, 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 about that. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to share with you that in coinciding with uh, National Parks and Recreation Month, this year the Parks and Recreation Commission will be offering our annual parks tour on July 13th, and we'd like to make certain that the council knows that they are invi invited to, uh, to attend, and there will be follow-up information that will be sent out to you. But if you want to mark that date, July 13th will be our annual parks and recreation tour. I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Item four is public hearings. Item 4A, please. A resolution authorizing an exception to the architectural review and landscape code for the property located at 1255 Park Avenue. Plan Commission recommended approval 4 to 0. Mrs. Christensen. Dennis Mulcahy, the owner and operator of Old Fashioned Bakery, is planning to remove and replace his entire parking lot, which requires compliance with the landscape code. Um, as a result, he's applying for an exception to sections 34.212B and 34.212C to waive the open green space requirement and the landscape strip requirement for that property located at 1255 Park Avenue. The open green space requirement states that property owners shall provide at least five feet of grass or living ground cover along interior side and rear property lines. He's seeking an exception to this requirement along both interior property lines and the landscape strip requirement states that property owners shall install a site specific amount of landscape landscaping, 10 landscape units per linear foot between a parking lot and an adjacent street or alley. While he can satisfy the requirement along Park Avenue, he's seeking an exception to this requirement along the alley. We did review this and Plan Commission reviewed it at its last meeting and unanimously recommended approval. Thank you. This is a public hearing and at this time I would like to open up the public hearing on item 4A. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on item 4A this evening? Anyone wishing to speak on, fight, on item 4A this evening? Third and final call, anyone wishing to speak on item 4A in the public hearing, uh, public hearings this evening? Seeing none, I would like to close the public hearing at this time and entertain a motion for approval. Motion. Mo motion by Lukey, second by DeForest. Councilor discussion. Councilor Van de Bogart? No, I was simply going to make the motion, but uh, David beat me to it. Thank you. Councilor Lukey, did you have a question or no? No. Okay. Councilor Nuno. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mrs. Christensen, so if I'm reading this correctly, then there is, the exception will make it to where there is no additional landscaping other than what is currently there on Park Avenue. Is that correct? Yes. So zero additional. Yes, because if he adds any landscaping, he will lose parking. Did we, uh, I have been through the process myself, did we look at uh, alternative options such as maybe taking one parking space in the center of, of the parking lot uh, on the, I guess that would be the south side, and, and concentrating it there? <clears throat> um, essentially, anything you do there will require him to lose parking stalls, and he really can't afford to lose parking stalls. And so we felt he met the hardship standards that were contained in the ordinance. Um, I mean, you can require, um, whatever you guys would like, but sure. that's where, where we looked at it. We did not want him to lose parking because we know that parking, I mean, there's just not a lot of parking spaces for him there. Very familiar with the break <coughs> um, it, So it, from the drawings that are here though, it's hard to get uh, a feel for it, though I've certainly been there plenty of times over the years. Mm -hmm. How many parking spaces do they have right now? Um, I'm gonna guess what? 18, 20? Yeah, something like that. I that. honestly don't know. I didn't count them, so I don't. And, and they, they weren't willing to lose one to try to come up with something like that? Um, no, and we felt he met the hardship standards in the ordinance, so we recommended approval, and so did Plan Commission. I mean, if you want to require a condition, I mean, we did include some conditions in the resolution, but we did not require him to put additional landscaping. So it's up to the council's will whether they want to add a condition requiring some landscaping on his site. Would I respond? 
Um, hold on, let's finish the council discussion. Any other council, uh, any other questions, Council Nuno? Uh, not at this point. Thank you, Council DeForest. Um, I did go out to the site and eyeball it. And <coughs> it appeared to me that any landscaping that was tempted to put in would make it difficult for entry and exit even into the parking lot. Um, it really is a tight spot. I didn't see any way that he could put the landscaping in. Um, to the owner's credit, he was trying to negotiate with an adjacent property owner to see if he could contribute some landscaping um, at the property that's immediately adjacent, um, bordering his property, which I believe he has secured that permission from that landowner there. Um, I didn't see any way to, to incorporate landscaping without hampering the ability for traffic in and out or for people to come or turn around inside there. I just didn't see it. And he does show the trees on the site plan, the mm -hmm. drawn, hand-drawn site plan, if you look. There are three trees shown on the, on the site plan, even though they're not on his property. I think it's remarkable that he was willing to go above and beyond to attempt to try to address the spirit, you know, of the landscaping. So. Anything else, Councilor DeForce? No, thank you. Councilor Noodle? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, you know, certainly want to do everything that we can to help them, and, and uh, they have been a great uh, attribute to our community. I, I would just encourage that, uh, you know, to always look for alternatives, such as the east side of this property. I'm looking at the pictures that are in the packet here. The east side of the property, so along the alley there, if, if one space was lost there, uh, that would obviously soften up the look in that, that neighborhood, which is the idea for this. Uh, and that doesn't appear to me that that would hinder track patterns coming in or out. Uh, Anything else? Um, I would just like to, to add, having been to that establishment a couple of times, I tend to lean towards um, Council DeForest's statement that the, the parking lot there is not as large as a lot of other parking lots. And I know that right now there's customers that probably park in the uh, supermarket parking lot to go in there. And I mm -hmm. think when you go in there first thing <coughs> in the morning, there's a lot of traffic in and out of that parking lot that I would also be afraid to start taking parking spaces away um, in already a tight a tight area. And, I, and I'm encouraged that he did you know, go up you know, beyond and, and talk to the neighboring uh, businesses or the owners and also doing all that he can to make sure. And I'm comfortable with staff's recommendation um, at the time because I'm, I'm confident that they've exhausted all options before they uh, came forward with this exemption. And I'm guessing on the alley side that the issue is really turn movements for trucks mm -hmm. if he's got food deliveries back there. Yeah. That would be the other, that, that would be the other thing. Mm -hmm. would, because I remember that came up when we were doing the whole save a lot thing with how that alley functioned. Yeah, because I'm, I'm afraid if you put landscaping back there, when deliveries come in, they might get ran uh, mowed down anyway yeah. with deliveries. So, mm -hmm. um, is there any, uh, Councilor Doodle? Thank you. I, I guess uh, I'm kind of passionate about this because it was only a couple of years ago that I owned uh, a property about a block from here. Mm -hmm. And I would like to commend the, uh, the department Plan Commission and the Council for showing understanding for the businesses. That was not the case at that point in those days. And so uh, I'm familiar with losing large numbers of parking spaces. Uh, and so I, I, I appreciate folks uh, trying to uh, help the business. Anything else? Any other comments? Seeing none, there is a motion and a second. Uh, um, on this item is uh, all those in favor say aye. aye aye any opposed hearing none passes seven zero item five is citizens participation uh, we come to a point on the agenda where citizens may step forward and speak we ask you to limit your comments to three minutes we ask you to state your name and, and address for the record we also ask that you refrain from personal attacks on staff and council um, and at this time we did have a couple people that filled out uh, sheets to speak the first one is our uh, Perry Verner, if you'd come forward and state your name and address, please. My name is Perry Verner. <clears throat> Excuse me. I live at 928 Copeland Avenue. I'm here to speak on the residential street parking in the Merrill community. Uh, by the Merrill community, I'm referring from uh, White Avenue down to Henry Avenue the nine and 10 hundred blocks of all those streets to go that distance, <clears throat> which are about 11 different streets. Uh, 
Currently, there's two hour parking limits for the residents. When do these time limits start and stop? One side parking, one side no parking. One street has alternate side parking, still all two hours. The two hour parking was initiated when Fairbanks Code Industries was in business. They have parking problems. I came to the city council about 10 years ago about this problem. And they assured me that they were gonna change the parking statuses down there and remove the signs. Unfortunately, they didn't. I walk out of my house the other morning and I had a ticket <clears throat> for, for time limit parking, over parking the time limit. This was at 8.55 a.m. in the morning. When did the two hours start? <clears throat> so I'm here to address the city council asking them to change the time limit parking up there, remove the two hour parking limits. We no longer have the parking problems that we had when Code Industries and Fairbanks was there. Uh, as well, in my block, the 9 and 10 hundred block of Copeland, all the way from Park Avenue up to Prairie Avenue, up by the Merrill uh, School. Supposedly there's no parking, stopping, standing, or running your engine. <laughs> uh, it's not enforced. In my particular block, the 9 and 10 hundred block, Supposedly, my side of the street has parking. The other side of the street has no parking. They have two signs that says no parking, one in each corner. In between, there's no signs. So the residents, they move in there, feel that they can park wherever they want to. And nobody enforces it. It's right on the bus line. The buses come, and they have to wait and go around. <coughs> the police officers. They even stop and wait to go around. And the signs are posted. Nobody enforces it. Yet they force this two-hour time limit at 9 o'clock in the morning. That means my two hours would have had to start at 655, right? So I'm here to address the city council, asking them to remove the two-hour <coughs> parking limits in the 9 to 10 hundred blocks of those streets from Keeler Avenue to Summit Avenue. They're still on the force there. And I don't know how many tickets were passed out on that particular day, but I was not happy. I paid the ticket, but I'm not happy. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Gary Fields. Please state your name and address on the record, please. Gary Fields, uh, 13826 Sundance Trail. Um, here to uh, address ordinance uh, or the number 7B, which is the uh, displaying of the rental permits. Um, I just want to, I'm a member of the BPMA, and I uh, wanted to thank Sheila for uh, coming to our meeting and listening to some of our concerns and uh, giving us an immediate response. Um, I'm in favor of removing this from the ordinance. Um, I believe it was probably put in there early on in years and and when the databases and technology wasn't there, and I really don't see the value added for the time spent uh, for this to be in the ordinance. So I guess we're here to um, to encourage the removal of it and to thank Sheila for uh, spending some time with us. Also encourage any other members to come to our meetings that would like to. Uh, they're down third Tuesday of the month down at Dominico's, at seven o'clock meeting, six o'clock dinner. So I would encourage uh, the rest of you to come down if you'd like and uh, visit our meetings and and we'll look forward to working with you throughout the future. Thank you. Thank you. Those are the only two that have signed up. Is there anyone else would like to speak under citizens' participation at this time? Okay. Seeing none, I would like to close the citizens' participation at this time. Move to item six, which is the consent agenda. All items listed under the consent agenda are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member so requests in which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered at this point on the agenda. Is there anyone would like any name removed from the consent agenda? Councilor DeForest. Mr. President, I'd like to request that item 6C be removed from the consent agenda, please. Okay. 
six C. Anyone else would like anything removed from the consent agenda? Uh, six A, Mr. President. I was not at that meeting, and I can't really vote to do uh, something that I wasn't at. Okay, six A and six C. At this time, the consent agenda would uh, include item six B. <laughs> 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 this is going to be this is going to be tough. So I want everybody to pay attention here. Okay, all those in favor of approving uh, item six B on the consent agenda, please. Is there a motion? I told you it's going to be tough. <laughs> motion by noon, or is there a second? Second, second by Haynes. All those in favor of approving item six B, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Six B passes. Item six A. Um, is the approval of the minutes of the Joint City Council and Community Development Authority meeting on June 6 and the regular meeting on June 6, uh, 2011. Uh, Councilor uh, Vander Bogart, do you have any questions or do you just simply want to no, remove? I, sim I simply didn't feel it's appropriate for me to vote on that since I was not in attendance at either of those uh, sessions. Oh, okay, thank you. Is there a motion for approval for 6A? Motion by DeForest. Is there a second? Second. Second by Sprite, sir. All those in favor? of approving item 6A, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And one abstention. And one, one abstention. Item 6C is a resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with the school district of Beloit for provision of adult school crossing guard services. Uh, Chief Jacobs, I'm um, as the presenter on this, Council DeForest, I will ask you, do you have uh, specific questions or would you like the presentation? Okay, is it okay with you if we just go right to the questions Certainly. or do you need the presentation? Certainly. Thank you, Chief Jacobs. Um, I, I just wanted to, to double check here um, in reading through the information that was provided. Um, I see that they will, the school district's planning to increase the number of crossing guards, yet they are requesting the same amount of funding as from the previous year. And I, I just wanted to see if I could get some clarification from you about their rationale from that, um, how closely have we spoken with them to make sure that their needs will be met, especially given the new elementary school alignment in terms of safety for the children. Um, I know that many parents and guardians have expressed concerns that now that some of those uh, younger elementary schools with concentrated uh, younger elementary won't have upper elementary kids that help with crossing like they did in the past. So. If you could comment at all about our, our collaboration with the school district to make sure their needs are being met. Sure. Uh, during in the negotiations for this contract, uh, we talked about the number of guards that we have at present, which is approximately a dozen. And the school district recognized that they needed more guards. They told us that they were interested in it. They believe that they may need up to four more guards because of because of the realignment of the schools and they're very aware of the younger children that would be crossing some intersections that might be a little bit busy so they did mention that they needed more guards however the uh, price of this contract is identical to what we've been paying in the last two years so it seemed reasonable not to be involved with where the crossing guards are going to be but to limit the, the costs of the program or at least put a cap on it for the city Okay, so I'm assuming the school district then will incur that additional cost. <coughs> Is that your understanding? That's my understanding because we have a limit on the amount of money that the uh, city will uh, support the school district with for the program. All right, and I, I know we don't want to meddle in the school district's affairs, but can I assume that at least if requested, our police department will work with them in terms of deciding safety wise what where would be strategically good places to put those additional guards yes okay. we will if, if we're asked uh, we can go out and our officers can make some help or make some decisions sure uh, we can give them information about where crashes are around the schools that might be good information for them to make decisions about that would be great would it be too much to be proactive and share that information with them without them asking or uh, I would prefer that they ask because it takes a bit of staff time uh, to create the queries to get the information and mm -hmm. present it okay great thank you sure anything else no thank you okay Second. motion by uh vander bogart seconded by newton all those in favor of uh, approving item 6c say aye aye any opposed hearing none passes uh, six zero item seven is ordinances seven eight please 
Proposed ordinance to amend section 31.19 of the Code of General Ordinances of the City of Beloit pertaining to occupancy limits for licensed premises. Attorney Casper. Thank you. <clears throat> the, before you is a request to, to repeal a bit of language that's in Chapter 31. Chapter 31 deals with uh, alcohol and its licensing and regulation in the city. Uh, this was brought to city staff attention, uh, mainly in conjunction with the renewal of licenses for uh, on-sale liquor premises, where some of those uh, uh, <coughs> license holders, uh, it was pointed out to them that they didn't have their occupancy limit posted, um, and they're not places of assembly like a, an, an on-sale. Uh, a bar would be uh, a packaged liquor store doesn't typically have a throng of people sitting down there and gathering for dancing or entertainment or, or those things and it uh, the history of, of, of this is a little bit obscure why it was put back in chapter 31 uh, I can't tell you we do have occupancy limits set elsewhere in both the building code and the fire code both of those codes adopt by reference uh, national and state standards for occupancy. Um, this was an oddball limit, different than those set in the national uh, and state codes. Uh, uh, and those, while those codes do set limits on non-assembly places, they primarily concentrate on places of gathering, uh, uh, where where people are are concentrated for longer periods of time. So. It was creating problems with licensure and, and renewals and inspections and uh, seems to serve no useful purpose, uh, I guess somewhat similar to what we did with the posting of the rental permits, the city would request that this one be uh, abolished. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to suspend the rules? Uh, I move that we suspend the rules, Mr. President. Okay, there's a motion to suspend the rules and go to uh, second reading. Is there a second? Motion by Van der second by Sprites. Are all those in favor of suspending the rules say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, pass it 6-0. Now to the merits. Uh, is there an approval? Motion by DeForest. Is there a second? Second. Second by Haynes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, it passes 7, I mean 6-0. Item 7B, please. Proposed ordinance to repeal section 14.06 sub 5 of the Code of General Ordinances of the City of Beloit relating to the display of rental permits. Mrs. Christensen, please. Um, section 14.065 requires landlords to display their rental permits in a conspicuous place on the premises for each of their units. Um, we don't believe this requirement is necessary any longer because we now enter this information in a MUNA software system and it's easy, easily accessible by city staff. My sense is that it probably was in place because when this ordinance was in place, initially all the inspectors didn't have computers because that has actually come in place in the last five or years, so years, and so they didn't all have access to that information. And they now do, and so we do not feel this is necessary section of code. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to suspend the rules? So moved. As motion by Amanda Bogart, is there a second? Second by Haynes. All those in favor of suspending the rules say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, pass it six to zero. Now to the merits. Is there a motion? Motion by DeForest. Second by Haynes. Council discussion. Council DeForest. Um, I would just like to commend uh, the city staff for being open to uh, the concerns raised by the Property Managers Association and our willingness to work with them. Um, and on making adjustments that are reasonable. So appreciate that that communication has been fostered and the, uh, the collaboration was open to that. So I'd like to commend the staff for that. Thank you. Councilor Van de Bogart. It certainly seems like this is a redundant piece of uh, bureaucracy that we can get rid of. Okay. Councilor Haynes. I'd like to remind the public that uh, this in no way lessens the requirement to have a, a, a per permit. It just simply re removes a, a very redundant, uh, meaningless uh, piece of code. Okay, thank you. I believe there is a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Hearing none, passes 6-0. Item 7C, please. Proposed ordinance amending terrace parking regulations. Mr. Bott. Thank you. And uh, staff discovered as they were looking through the ordinance that there was a, I don't say a disconnect, but there, there are a lot of listed locations of, that allow terrace parking that were no longer in existence or weren't, weren't functioning as such uh, that would allow terrace parking. And so they reviewed the list, went on site to check out the location <coughs> to make sure that uh, there was in fact not being used for terrace parking and offered to the council to remove a number of these locations that are currently in the ordinance and then update the ordinance with the current locations of places where we know that there's terrace parking actively being used. So people who uh, use terrace parking and want terrace parking are in compliance and those who don't need it, we don't have it listed on the books because it really doesn't serve a purpose to have it on the books if it doesn't even exist in the field anymore. So this is just a cleanup of the ordinances. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to suspend the rules? Motion by the fourth, second by noon. And all those in favor of suspending the rules, say aye. 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 Any opposed? You know, pass it six zero. Now to the merits. Motion by noon. Is there a second? Second by Haynes. Councilor discussion. Yeah. Councilor Van der Bogart. Yes, Mr. Potts, uh, does, <coughs> excuse me, do these uh, changes that we're contemplating here affect the, qu the question that uh, the gentleman raised earlier this evening about parking on, I believe it was Copeland and in the Merrill neighborhood? No, it does not. Uh, these are places where people would be allowed to park on the terrace. He's talking about just on street parking, I believe. Okay. okay. Thank you. Councilor DeForest. Um, I'd like to ask if of all of these uh, former uh, addresses that did have terrace parking, do we send notices out to them to make sure that they were not using the terrace parking any longer? I know some of these don't even exist anymore, but do we, uh, I just want to make sure due diligence was completed to make sure we try to notice all these individuals. Yes, there was, there were, they tried to contact everybody who would have it. Uh, this was done prior to the traffic review committee meeting so they could come and speak to that if they had a, there was a concern with it. But the intent wasn't to try to remove any locations, but just trying to make sure we listed the ones who currently are using terrace parking. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, passes 6-0. Item 8 is appointments. I, uh, Kevin D. Levy, duly elected president of the Boy City Council, subject to the confirmation <laughs> of the Boy City Council, does hereby appoint the following citizen members to the vacancies and terms indicated below. Said appointments being pursuant to nominations made and approved by the Appointment <laughs> Review Committee at a regular meeting held June 13, 2011. To the Alcohol Beverage License Control Committee, um, John Metter, for a term expiring June 30, 2014. Uh, to the Appointment Review Committee, Marlene Erickson for a term expiring December 31st, 2012. Merlin Knitzer uh, for a term expiring December 31st, 2013. Board of Appeals, Randall Fior for a term expiring May 31st, 2014. To the Municipal Library Board, Sandra Kincaid for a term expiring June 30th, 2014. And John Mitchell uh, for a term expiring June 30th, 2014. To the Plan Commission, James Farragher uh, for a term expiring April 30th, 2014. And to Police and Fire Commission, Gary Gard for a term expiring April 30th, 2015. Uh, is there a motion for approval? Motion, motion by Newham. Is there a second? Second by Haynes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Passes 6-0. Item 9 is Council Activities and Upcoming Events. Uh, Councilor Sprite, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I had the uh, privilege of participating in the Steve Craig uh, Memorial Bike Path dedication uh, the previous Saturday, as well as going on a bike ride with a number of uh, city staff, uh, fellow councilors, and uh, the members of Steve's family and the public. Uh, it was a, a real privilege to be able to be a part of that and uh, to honor Steve in that way, especially by being out and being active. Uh, and uh, I want to let everybody know that the bike path is, is now uh, in his name. There's signs up, and everybody should be out enjoying it while we have the nice weather. Um, also very much uh, enjoyed the meetings that we had uh, uh, two weeks ago uh, with the 
Janesville City Council, the South Beloit City Council, and uh, <coughs> our school board. Uh, I thought they were all very good meetings and, uh, and hope that we can build on those in the future. Thank you. Councilor Noodle. Uh, very briefly, because the other counselors are going to have so much to say about the, uh, the All-America City Award, but uh, just can't say enough what a great job the staff and citizens and others did to prepare for this. I, everyone should see this as a great win. It's a great opportunity to reinvigorate our pride in our community, as well as a great economic development tool for our city. And I, I, I hope everyone feels very good about it, and I, I hope that we will strongly consider, uh, it sounds like we may, um, reapplying again for next year. Thank you. Councilor DeForest. Uh, where to begin? <laughs> uh, first, I'd just like to acknowledge an honor of the designation of Parks and Recreation Month um, to share that I was able to enjoy Big Hill Park recently and the flax and columbine were in bloom. And I would encourage you, if you can get out there, to go as often as possible. Every two weeks, there's different wildflowers that are blooming. So I'm excited to go sometime soon and find out what's replaced the flax and the columbine. <coughs> Um, I, I also am um, very excited about the collaborative meetings that we had with the Janesville and South Beloit City Councils as well as the school district and look forward to continue communication and collaboration with them. Uh, and of course, the, the privilege and honor of being part of the All-America City delegation um, was exceptional. I'd like to just read off the names of our local residents who participated um, to acknowledge their effort. It was quite a sacrifice for them. We were gone for five full days, so for them to, uh, to take off of work or to um, leave their busy schedules to join us. And um, they did an exceptional job making a case for why Beloit is great. And, and those are Debbie Fisher, Dominique Davidson, Stephen Parker, Luz Frontera, Angelica Schwartz, Barb Millsap Morrow, Joseph Morrow, Therese Oldenburg, and Karen Arft. Um, so we're grateful for the local residents who um, went with uh, us as officials and city staff. Uh, I think one of the most exciting things that I saw was at the cultural showcase <laughs> where all of the, the cities had booths how many people I encouraged to try a bag of kettle chips that never had seen kettle chips before. And by the end of the night, everyone was walking around with a bag of kettle chips in their hand and saying how much they liked it. So um, that was fantastic. Uh, and, and certainly we, we were able to get out the word about Beloit and what a fantastic place this is um, to be. So thank you for that privilege of, of representing you. Councilor Haynes. Well, at the risk of some certain amount of redundancy, I, I I have to commend everyone who went with us to, uh, uh, to Kansas City at the All-American City uh, Awards. Uh, I think the spirit we showed was amazing. Uh, we were well prepared. <coughs> we were, I, I, I think we did a very, very good job of presenting ourselves. And I think we really belonged on the, uh, on the stage as one of, one of the winners. But this is a certain amount of learning curve, and I, and I know that we'll redouble, redouble our efforts, and I think we have nothing to feel ashamed about. Um, so, and, uh, you know, I, I, I do know the caliber of our city, and having you know, lo looked at some of the cities that won, I know that we belong with them. So uh, I do appreciate that, and uh, uh, I think that's everything I have to add. Thank you. Councilor Vanda Bogart. Thank you, Mr. Levy. Uh, I also enjoyed the trip to uh, Kansas City. Uh, it was an opportunity to uh, explain and showcase our community. And while we were not successful in the final analysis of winning the ultimate award, we did make the finals, and many, many communities did not. So I think we have nothing to feel uh, uh, badly about. I think we all did a very, very good job. Um, it, however, did attend uh, uh, or cause one problem for me, and I'm sure for my fellow counselors as well as others, including Mr. Arf. Uh, we had an inability to attend the funeral or visitation for our former council member, uh, Marty Dench's spouse, Colleen. And I certainly would have, if uh, were, I were in the community, have uh, welcomed the opportunity to go and be supportive of him and his family. Uh, so that was a bit of a, a negative issue. Uh, looking forward, uh, I would encourage people to participate in the multitude of events that we have going on all summer on the riverfront, outside, everywhere you go. There's activities. Please get out, take advantage of, of what we have. Winter will come all too soon, and we'll all be huddled inside with our parkas. Uh, um, and the other thing, last point would be we're, we're not going to have a, uh, a council meeting before uh, the 4th of July, so I would recommend and, re and remember, uh, remind people rather to uh, be careful as you use your fireworks and displays and uh, 
we don't want to have a repetition of a situation a couple of years ago where a young lady blew her hand off. I mean, that's just plain idiocy. So, so be careful with that stuff. Thank you. And then I have a couple. I will also um, echo uh, Councilor <coughs> Vander Bogart's condolences to uh, Marty Dench. Uh, I did have an opportunity to speak with him, so we want everyone to keep him and his family in his prayers. I was also able to uh, attend the Steve Gregg uh, dedication. I did not, however, ride in the bike um, on the bike journey, but I did ride my bike, Councilor DeForest, down to the event. So I do want you to know that for those of you who always say I will not ride my bike, I did ride it down to the event and then the biggest struggle that I had as I shared with Rebecca is which hill is the least to kind of pedal back up to get back home. Um, so I wanted that to Councilor DeForest to know that I did take an opportunity and the Councilor DeForest, um, city manager wanted me to go on the bike ride and I just encouraged him that I need to take this slow. I had not been out in a while so I didn't want to, uh, you know, start out full speed ahead and he encouraged me. He says only six miles and I said, but who's going to do the other five for me if I do the first mile? So, <laughs> but I do um, re greatly appreciate um, his family being here for that and I greatly appreciate the city for a wonderful job um, during the dedication and um, um, everything is along the bike trail as well. So I would encourage everybody to get out and, and ride along and, and look at the great things that's going on in the great city of uh, Beloit. That concludes um, council activities and upcoming events. Item 10 is city manager's presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. I have full confidence that you could have easily <laughs> completed that bike ride if you had chosen to join us. So uh, next time we're going to insist. We'll, we'll meet you at your house. <laughs> Uh, I just had a few comments I wanted to share with council and the community regarding the All-America City competition. Uh, several of the councilors have, have already commented. We had a very, very dedicated, hardworking delegation that included a number of citizens as well as several city councilors and the, uh, most of the members of the city manager's staff. Uh, we did a good job. We represented the city extremely well. Uh, we got very, very positive feedback, not only from the judges, but also uh, from a number of people that were in attendance. So we certainly showcased the city in a very positive way. And uh, we were obviously all very disappointed we didn't win, uh, but there were a lot of great uh, programs there. and All the cities had some wonderful experiences dealing with civic engagement, uh, bringing their citizens on board to help in, in moving those cities forward. So we certainly were in good company. Uh, of all the cities in the United States, only 26 were selected to participate uh, in this competition. Uh, only 23 uh, ended up uh, uh, doing so, and only 10 of those, of course, could be, uh, could be recognized. And uh, in and of itself, just being a finalist and being invited is a very prestigious recognition. They presented us with a certificate, and I understand there's a plaque on the way uh, that we will very proudly display in the city's showcase, uh, again, indicating that we were a finalist this year. Um, we are uh, looking at the future. I don't know whether uh, we'll want to go through this again next year or not, but uh, we certainly learned a lot, and uh, I think we would have a, a little better focus <coughs> on what we would need to do uh, so that we went back again uh, that, we would, uh, that we would be a winner. So we'll be talking about that in the weeks ahead, and we've got a little time yet to make a decision as to whether or not uh, we want to try uh, a second time. But it was a great experience. Um, I think uh, you know, Councillor DeForest commented on the kettle chips. We had product there from uh, Frito-Lay, and we had product there <coughs> from Harmel, uh, which uh, everybody recognized. Those are household brand names going back decades, but many of the people had never heard of kettle chips, and so it was amazing uh, to see. Of course, the Frito-Lay products also all disappeared, but a lot of people were eating kettle chips really for the first time. So it was an opportunity to promote some of our local uh, food service industries here in Beloit. If there are any questions from counselors, I'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I think that concludes my formal comments. Is there any questions? <coughs> How does the Councilors. cheer go again, Mr. Herr? Yeah, I also learned the high school cheer. Uh, we were all, uh, we all got very proficient at that and performed it with flawlessly when we went in uh, to appear before the judges. Actually, the presentation went off extremely well. We had photographs. And we also had letters on the back, uh, the Beloit B. In it saying, which has kind of been a, I guess was developed by the Downtown Beloit Association, <clears throat> but has come to kind of be a branding item for the city of Beloit, a way of uh, articulating all the excitement 
about the tremendous transformation the city's undergone in the last two decades. So we were able to get all of those uh, up, the pictures on time and the letters on time, and so we were ready. Okay. Councilor Spreitzer. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, not a question, but I just wanted to note I didn't mention earlier on the councilor comments because this was on the agenda, but one note I also had the opportunity to attend and, and was thrilled to be able to be a part of the delegation to the competition. And, uh, you know, I think I think as has been said, uh, after we got up and, and gave our presentation and uh, heard the reaction from the judges, I think we all felt like winners and I think we felt <laughs> that way. So uh, it was fantastic to be a part of it and, and to get to meet so many people from so many other great cities who are doing a lot of cool projects that I think we can learn from and, and that we were able to showcase what Beloit has to offer to them. Thank you. Councilor DeForest. I'd just like to add, I think we would be remiss if we didn't thank Beth Jacobson and Samantha Tinko for really being the behind the scenes, spearheading all of the hard work, the logistics, the getting up at the <coughs> 6 in the morning. <laughs> um, really appreciate you, Beth and Samantha, for the work you did. Thank you. Thank you very much for reminding me of that. Uh, Beth actually was uh, the captain of our team and had to make all the early morning meetings and coordinated all the logistics and they did a wonderful job. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing none, moving on. Okay, Councilor Noodle. I, I, I keep hearing these <laughs> stories about this uh, this cheer. I'm just wondering if if, uh, if if any of the attendees are brave enough maybe to, to share this cheer or maybe they want to do it collectively. I, I see Beth is really excited out there in the audience right now. I, you know, I, think, I think when we if we if we could if if let me can I make a suggestion here? Let me just make a suggestion before we uh, go crazy here in the forum. Um, we Councilor DeForest, my suggestion is going to be I need you to calm down a little bit. Uh, let us go through item eleven A and before we adjourn. How we about if we do it at that particular moment? Okay, we just want to get through the agenda because the cheer technically is not on the agenda, so we need to finish the the posted agenda first and then we will go into extracurricular activities, okay? Make sure we keep, make sure we keep the cameras I just, want to, I just want to make sure we... Embarrassment effect, right. I, I, I see Attorney Castro was panicking down there, so we're going to finish the posted agenda first, and before we go, they'll be more than happy to do that for us, okay? <laughs> Anything else under item uh, 10? <laughs> item 11, please. A resolution amending the 2011 capital improvements budget for the purchase of a 500-kilowatt trailer-mounted generator for use by water resources. Mr. Botts, please. We'll go quick so we get into this <laughs> chair. Uh, <laughs> we're asking the council to consider amending the 2011 capital program in order for the water resources division to purchase this uh, backup generator. The purpose in this generator would be to supply backup power to uh, mainly the Sherwin Avenue lift station. It will also be, could be used on the uh, Turtle Creek list station as well as a number of our uh, well sites around town. Uh, we'll be installing a, the connection device to make it you know, portable to a number of our locations around town as well as what we do for all of our other types of generators we have for the operations. The, the, the emphasis for doing it, the one to get this size one, is in order to properly operate the Sherwood Avenue list station, which is our biggest one, and basically it, it uh, takes care of the sewage on the entire west side of Beloit and even probably half of the east side, is that uh, that's the station that pumps the sewage out to the wastewater treatment plant. And if that one were to go down because of a loss of power for whatever reason, it would uh, uh, cause problems with our sewer system. You know, I guess a couple reasons is it's close to the river. I mean, we wouldn't want to have an overflow at that location. and. Uh, uh, that would cause backups to a number of locations around town if we were to not be able to properly operate that lift station. So that's one reason for what we, why we want to have a backup generation uh, for that as well as just to uh, make sure that we can have it available to um, provide the um, emergency power if we need it at the, for the lift station. Thank you. So those are some of the main reasons why we want to have it and would like the council to consider allowing us to purchase that. Okay. Is there a motion to approve? approve? Motion by Haynes. Is there a second? Second. Second by Newnham. Council discussion. Council DeForest. Uh, I know we've talked about this a little bit already. Um, can you help explain why this wasn't included originally in the previous CIP? I believe it was included earlier in the capital improvement program <laughs> process, and uh, for whatever reason, 
there may have been discussion about whether or not we should postpone doing this, but uh, one of the reasons we found that there was a vendor who had one of these uh, generators available and it met the, it's a, a 2010 model which still has the, that style of emission standards on it and the 2011 models and up have a different emission standard which causes the price to go up on them because of the new uh, air quality requirements on the diesel engines. So if I could follow up, um, this is a fairly opportunistic time because there's a piece of equipment that we can get at a deal yes, for this. We believe so. Yeah. Okay, and then also uh, if you could comment on whether there's the potential for this to be a shared piece of equipment with another municipality to help offset some of the cost. Well, I don't know if we'd be able to share in the purchase of it as much as but we would have it available if someone else were to need it and be taken to their site and be used. We look at that as far as our... Um, um, I think what we call it, the uh, emergency management uh, agreements we have with other communities that we would share equipment with them. So uh, if someone were to need a, a generator of that size, we could certainly, you know, allow it to be used outside the community. Would it be possible, though, for another community to, to share in the purchase of the piece of equipment? The, the, the problem with that is then there's probably a discussion, <coughs> okay, where is this piece of equipment going to stay? Who's going to maintain it? It's uh, a lot easier that if we have that piece of equipment, we maintain it and use it. If someone else you know, has a need for it, we can share with them, they, uh, let them use it. And if they have something and we need some kind of future, we can use it from that, mm -hmm. you know, something that they have a, from their facilities. So it's, it, you, you get into some difficulty when you actually share in the cost of something with somebody else because you know, who's gonna be, I guess, responsible for that piece of equipment? It's better we just let them use it or we use some of their equipment when we have mm -hmm. time to use those. I, I just ask, it's a very big ticket item, and mm -hmm. I mean, I would assume we could work that out if we're creative. I mean, do you think there's actually safety or response time issues that prohibit that? Well, th that could be. If it was uh, perhaps sitting up in Janesville and we were to need it by the time we had staff available to go get it and bring it back, that may cause a problem with, you know, getting the system up and running in a timely manner. Okay, and I guess just to underscore, um, I guess I see this as one of the reasons why an inventory of all of our major equipment that we could share with area municipalities and requesting that they do the same, you know, would help underscore. Uh, mm -hmm. So I guess I would just. We have to, all those. Okay. And we have that same with our mutual aid agreement. You know, everybody, all the communities that are involved with that have a list of their equipments. All right, thank you. Council Van der Bogart. Well, Councilor DeFore, I shared a number of concerns that I've had as well. Um, I believe earlier in the evening I was asking the questions about the number of times this piece of equipment might have been used in the last, you pick the number of years. Do you know whether, and this is a different question, uh, and the answer was zero, but do you know whether or not, uh, for example, the town of Beloit sewer treatment has this sort of a backup uh, item, a 500 kilowatt generating mobile trailer, or the City of South Beloit has one, or anyone's around here. I mean, this is a little bit like some of the fire department piece of apparatus, the the heavy rescue stuff that that you hope you never need, and maybe you never have needed, and you're only going to need it once, and it saves your bacon. But it's a hundred and ninety thousand dollar piece of stuff that's sitting there, and uh, you know, if it's if it's used once in twenty years, uh, I guess maybe it's worth it. But uh, uh, I mean, it's 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 not twenty five thousand dollars. It's a lot more than that. Right offhand, I couldn't tell you whether or not any of the adjacent communities have that size of a piece of <laughs> equipment. Uh, I don't know what the power needs are for the uh, town of Turtles or town of Beloit's uh, treatment plant, and I don't know what the needs are for the city of South Beloit's. Um, I guess it's an insurance policy more than anything else. If you have a piece of, if you have a failure, and you don't have the equipment you wish you had and then you try to scramble around to find somebody who has one that you may be able to get a hold of. Yeah. And then you got to make sure you have the right connection devices that might connect into it. I mean, there's a bunch of logistic, you know, yeah. reasons. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't plan for that, you know, to look out and try to find who has that stuff and who can, um, you know, use those pieces of equipment. But Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Councilor Spritzer. Thank you. Um, I noticed uh, you said that this uh, this would power two different uh, lift stations. Uh, would it be able to power them both simultaneously, mm -hmm. or what do we do if there's something that hits the entire city and they're both out? 
Well, this one could power both of those. Uh, one of the other generators that we had approved in the program to buy this year is a smaller one that could power the Turtle Creek lift station. It doesn't need, require as much power. So if something were to cause the entire electrical circuit in the, you know, in the city to go down, uh, there would be a lot of scrambling trying to get, you know, first of all, trying to get our wells to function, but then trying to get our uh, sewer system to also function. We would hope that, I mean, this is, like, like I mentioned, this is more or less of an insurance policy. That we would hope that we'd never have to use this piece of equipment. I guess, you know, that'd be the thing. And, and granted, yes, it is expensive to have out there, but if there's ever any instance where we would lose that much power for some whatever reason, it, that $190,000 would probably be going to be insignificant. If I could ask a follow-up. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to, to, to figure out is, is if, if something is happening in a relatively specific location, mm -hmm. you know, that might be more likely to be a case where we could borrow something from somebody else if we had that uh, put in place ahead of time, because they're not going to need it too. Right. If we have something that hits the whole area, then this isn't going to even solve our problem. So I, I, I'm trying to figure out if we're not, in, you know, in some sort of in-between zone where, where we are neither solving our problem nor in a situation where we need to have this thing. Yeah. We've... Um we, we have a number of backup generators already that will serve different pieces of the system. We just didn't have anything large enough. In fact, at the wastewater plant uh, a couple of years ago, we installed a backup generator that would basically operate the treatment plant, which was a, a huge. It's bigger than this, and it's a permanently installed fixture out there. We just didn't have anything that would, at this size, it would operate you know, these types of facilities we had. And that's what we were trying to do is just complete the puzzle to make sure that we had backup generation to basically serve all the citizens we could. Anything else? Um, okay. Council Noon. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so uh, I guess a couple of questions. Uh, well, one, I was hoping since uh, from our earlier workshop, uh, I thought it was significant when you were discussing the time frame. So after I ask my question, maybe you can go over that, uh, how quickly this uh, could become a, a serious situation if we did need this uh, piece of equipment. Uh, and my question is, is, uh, is it so specialized that we wouldn't be able to use it if we had some other catastrophic problem in another department? Like, uh, since, since it is mobile, if something happened at, we had a microburst and uh, some other facility in town went down, uh, would we be able to use it at that location as well? Or is it specific to uh, the lift stations? No, our intent would make that uh, basically you have to install electrical connection circuitry <coughs> at each of our locations. And we've identified probably half a dozen different locations we could take this piece to and plug it in. We've got uh, bigger well pumps that would require a, a bigger motor to operate those. And uh, we've, we've identified all those in a list that we would, you know, put the power to. Uh, as far as how long, uh, I guess on an on an average time, you know, it, uh, maybe an hour. If the turtle, if the Sherwood Avenue lift station were to lose power, it would take it that long to fill up before we'd cause a problem. And so then we would have really a catastrophic situation of sewage backup because so many lines go to that particular lift station over here on Sherwood Avenue because the old wastewater treatment plant was was right over here. Correct. So we wouldn't have time to try to access this piece and you. Know, Hopefully we don't need it, but if we do, uh, it's going to be the greatest <laughs> thing that we've spent money on in a long time. Councilor Haynes. I think I want to get a handle on the consequences. So we know that if in an hour, two hours, or whatever, the, 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 the wells will fill up. Is there a possibility that the sewage would, would will it just back up, or will it overflow those wells and dump raw sewage into, into the rock? Well, what we would end up doing there's uh, <coughs> another major lift station that pumps into that Sherrill and Avenue lift station. We'd have to shut that one down. And that's on the other side of the river, right by the old carry buildings over there. And we start to have to shut down the other pumps that feed into that system, which eventually would get back into the neighborhood, which caused backup if we just couldn't, you know, move the, the sewage down the line. And that's where you'd end up getting some of your problems. <coughs> Probably not immediately at that one, because we would shut conditions down to, uh, the gravity flow would come in. To, it, it'd be some gravity coming into it. We could handle that. But if you shut down the other lift stations back up the line, they fill up, you know, you have to shut it down, and then you, you know, you keep working back up so that you try to avoid 
you know, uh, as much overflow as possible, but you're, you're compounding your problem upstream. Councilor DeForest. Uh, this is a pretty expensive insurance policy, so um, forgive all our questioning, but can we assume that the liability of a sewer backup would exceed the cost of this piece of equipment? I mean, if, if you could foresee if there was the degree, we're not an expert, we don't know how significant the sewer backups would be. Would the cost that, of liability the city would incur from those sewer backups, would that exceed the cost of this piece of equipment? I guess that'd be a really difficult question to quantify without uh, you know, I, it could or could not. I mean, don't know. I mean, I, we really don't know what extent it would cause it to back up and get into people's homes and, you know, those types of things, or even overflow into ri through the river someplace if, you know, if the systems couldn't operate properly. And I guess finally, if I could just underscore again, uh, one of my colleagues asked if um, our surrounding municipality had this piece of equipment or one that we could use like it and you weren't able to comment. And I guess I want to underscore again, I would like to see a detailed inventory of what other municipalities have so we, we know exactly um, what's available to us. Um, this is a really high ticket item. Um, I guess I'm wondering if we had more time to investigate it, where, where's your window of opportunity in terms of <coughs> purchasing this older model? Well, I mean, it's, it's available. I don't know if they're looking to sell it to anybody else or not, but mm -hmm. um, I guess the, um, the urgency is just to try to you know, get it under our control. Anything else, Councilor DeForest? No, thank you. Council Vanny Bogart. Uh, any exploration about uh, the idea of getting a used piece of equipment? I mean, surely standby diesel generating capacity for all kinds of buildings is, is built in. I'm familiar with the old courthouse up the hill here. Uh, they had a Fairbanks Morse generator in the basement. They turned it over once a month. Uh, I don't know what capacity it was, but all kinds of facilities have these things. And, and I know it wouldn't have necessarily the mobility, but, uh, but you could put that perhaps on a, on a rack and pull it around perhaps. But, uh, has any thought gone into a used item? Uh, well, when we spoke to the different vendors looking for a piece of equipment like this, no one, the, I don't believe any of the vendors jumped up and said, hey, we got some used ones here. Would you look that? Look at those. Oh, well, yeah, they want to sell you new ones. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, um, I guess the, when we asked the questions to the vendors out there, this is what we're looking for. What do you have available? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they came forward with the proposals on the equipment they had. Mm -hmm. Well, as I guess you've t got, gotten from the tenor of my questioning, I, I certainly understand the concept, uh, but the $190,000 for a piece of the equipment that's never been used uh, and may never be used, uh, sure be nice if we could get a used one for 50 grand. Uh, that's my, my two cents. Uh. <coughs> Councilor Sprite, sir. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, hearing the discussion and based on, on my feelings, I'm inclined to to, to lean toward maybe if we might look at laying this over and seeing if we can get some more information. Uh, it sounds like you, you wouldn't be terribly concerned about going a couple more weeks on this. You don't think it's terribly likely to get away from us. Is that correct? I, I think we can do that and get some information from you. I guess uh, I would move that we uh, lay this over until our next meeting uh, in the hopes that we could uh, investigate options for a possibly use generator, find out if there are any uh, adjoin, uh, adjacent municipalities that might have a, a generator that we would be able to enter into an lo advanced logistical arrangement with, uh, or if there are any other uh, alternative options uh, besides uh, what we have on the table right now. I'll okay, it's been motioned and uh, second that we lay this over. Uh, this is usually where we'd have council comments, so let me do that. Let me do it this way. Has been in motion and second to lay this over, and I would ask during that time frame between the next couple of weeks if any other counselor has any questions that we make sure that we I get them to Mr. Botts. I I really appreciate the questioning tonight, um, but I think um, he knows kind of where the council is sitting. Um, mm -hmm. But I think within the next <laughs> next couple of weeks, if we could send him um, an email or contact him with additional questions in that way. Um, and then, um, Mr. Botson, maybe refer to the city manager as well. Is there a way that maybe we can get uh, some information back to us before the uh, next council meeting to answer some of these questions so at that meeting we're prepared to act on it at that time? 
that is that and is there any do you need further clarification of where the council wants you to go with this mr bots or would you just want to oh. wait for the questions yeah i think i can uh, if there's there any other questions that come up i'll be certainly glad to try to get the information but i pretty much understand what you're looking for okay okay is that is that fair with all the counselors okay um there is a motion and a second to lay this over to our next meeting all those in favor say aye aye any opposed hearing none it is uh we'll lay this over to our next meeting um and then before we go you see them every first and third monday night here in the forum you've seen them in the memorial day parade you've seen them at several functions in the city of beloit if you come to the fourth floor you see a couple of them working there uh whenever the paper has a nice article or some criticism of what's going on in the city you see quotes from these individuals uh they have been on a world tour uh, to kansas city um competing uh, for a prestigious award even though they did not win um <laughs> some of them and that's not a derogatory uh thing there um even though they did not place uh you didn't get to see it live so for those of you viewing tonight all of you 100,000 people that's viewing this broadcast this evening and those of you that are packing the form in standing room only fashion I present at this time to you the uh, Beloit City Council and Beloit City staff uh, all-american city competitor uh, competition cheerleaders at this time if you would please step up at the form if we, if we could get you, go to the forum, go to the forum, because Beth, go to the forum, because Beth has to jo join, so go to the podium. We'll send you to the podium so Beth could come down and join you at that time, too. So, you saw it here first, people. Um, Twitter, here we come. Facebook. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll wait till afterwards and give him a standing ovation. Brad, are you ready? You guys ready for this? And to, uh, to book this group, you can call 364-6600. And at the next basketball game or next function that you may have, they are available on the weekends and in, on evenings as well. And with that, uh, item 12, is there a motion to adjourn? Okay. Motion by the four. Is there a second? Second. Second by Sprite. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we are adjourned.